Thanks, Dave, for reading that for us. Um, and yeah, we come to the end of 1 Peter today. Um, it'd be really great to have a Bible open in front of you so you can look on. Uh, but let me pray as we come to this part of God's Word. <clears throat> Father God, we do thank you for this uh, uh, letter that we've been able to reflect on over this term. Uh, we thank you for all that you've been teaching us about what you've done for us in Christ and how it is that we are to live as your people in the world. And though we pray that you continue to be uh, showing us more of those things uh, today. Amen. Well, they say there's uh, three things that matter when it comes to real estate. Uh, you've probably heard it. Uh, location, location, location. Uh, well, St. Augustine made a similar statement about Christianity, about what matters most in the Christian life. He said this, if you ask me concerning the precepts of the Christian religion, first, second, and third, and always, I would answer, humility. Humility, humility, humility. And uh, friends, as we come to the final part of Peter's letter today, then I think the importance of humility is really the main theme that Peter leaves us with. Uh, if you've got a newsletter there in front of you today um, or on the screen, we'll see uh, today that Peter speaks first about being humble servants in the church, um, that for those, um, well, within all of our relationships in the church, they are to be defined by humility. Uh, second, he then goes on to speak about our humble status in the world, uh, that as we live now as exiles and aliens and strangers here, that we occupy a humble position in the world. And then third, um, Peter closes this letter by urging us to humbly stand in God's grace, not relying on our own strength, but humbly trusting in his grace and promises to us. So that's what we're going to think about today as we, as we are those who follow Christ, who humbled himself for us. Well, what is to define our relationships within the church, uh, within the world, and um, before God is humility. So first of all, what does it look like for humility to define our relationships within the church? Well, um, Peter, in this first section, he speaks to uh, three different groups here. Uh, first to elders in verses 1 to 4, and then in verse 5, uh, the first half of that to those who are younger, uh, and then um, the second half of verse 5 to all of you. Uh, so we see here that humility is to define all of those relationships. But first in verse 1, he speaks to elders. He says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Now, notice that even uh, right off the bat here, um, Peter demonstrates his own humility in that opening sentence, uh, appealing as a fellow elder. Uh, Peter, in his position, he could have uh, claimed his authority as an apostle, <clears throat> but instead he chooses to stand alongside and appeal as a fellow elder. And uh, like those in the churches that he writes to, uh, well, Peter describes himself as a fellow witness of Christ's sufferings. Uh, that probably refers uh, not so much to what Christ himself suffered, but what he suffered through the church, uh, the sufferings of the church and those who have suffered for Christ. And uh, he also describes himself as a fellow sharer in the glory to be revealed in the last day. There's no uh, hint of supremacy here by Peter. Rather, he positions himself in this humble stance of coming alongside as an equal. And as uh, he then uses that um, term elder here in verse 1, it's likely I think he's referring to a broader group than uh, like those who would be today inducted into an office of elder. Uh, I think it certainly includes people in those positions. But I think Peter, as he writes, is he probably has in mind a, a much broader group, really all of those in any kind of uh, position of leadership or oversight in the church. So it means that if you are an elder here at St. Aidan's or if you're a leader of any kind, a uh, small group leader, someone who helps by leading a kids' church or youth group, um, if you have any kind of oversight, well, Peter here is uh, speaking to you. And what is his instruction? Well, the primary instruction in verse 2 is be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. That imagery there of shepherding and sheep um, has a rich backstory in the Bible. Uh, God in many places is described as Israel's shepherd. Uh, Jesus comes as the good shepherd. 
Uh, Jesus said to Peter, he said, feed my sheep. And now Peter is passing that on to leaders in the churches. He says, be for them the kind of shepherd that the Lord was to Israel. Be for them the kind of shepherd that Jesus is to us. And that includes a whole lot of things, doesn't it? It includes uh, knowing the sheep, leading them, caring for them, protecting them. Uh, there's much that we could say about that. Um, but Peter here in this section gives three statements to fill out what he's saying shepherding should look like. And each time he says, it's not like this, but it's like this. Um, so the first one in verse two, he says, it's not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. So we're not going to do a very good job of shepherding if we're doing it under compulsion. Uh, the motivation needs to be that it is willing because we love those under our care. Uh, I've got a friend in ministry who I think wrestled with this in a really healthy way. Uh, when he finished an MTS apprenticeship, like what Joash is doing with us, uh, he was then thinking about going to college to train for ministry. And uh, there was lots of things that he really loved about doing uh, pastoral ministry. But he really wrestled with the question of, was he doing it because he loved the ministry or because he loved the people he was ministering to? I think that's a really good question for any of us to consider who are in any kind of church leadership. Uh, the second thing Peter says about shepherding is uh, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. And most likely he's speaking here about financial gain and greed. Uh, that must not be the motivation. Peter's saying leaders mustn't be on about seeking earthly rewards Instead, what he wants to see is eager service. And then shepherding, uh, verse 3, is not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So in all of these ways, we see that leadership in the church is following the example of leadership that Jesus gave us. Uh, he is the chief shepherd who came willingly uh, not seeking his own gain, but coming to serve humbly and sacrificially, uh, leaving an example for his disciples to do the same. And so we see here, don't we, that leadership in the church, uh, it's going to look different to leadership in the world around us. It's not about service. Sorry, it's not about uh, status. It's about service. Uh, it's not about promoting yourself. It's about loving others. And uh, really, that's the lesson that Jesus had to teach his disciples. I remember when James and John and the disciples are arguing about who's going to get the best seats in the kingdom. Well, Jesus sits them down and says, well, that's not how it is in my kingdom. Uh, it's not like the rulers of the Gentiles who lord it over others. Now, whoever wants to be great in my kingdom must be a servant. That's the model for all of us in Jesus' kingdom, and especially for those in any position of leadership. And uh, while recognition or reward in this life should not be the motivator for humble service, well, in verse 4, well, Peter does show us the reward that truly matters. He says in verse 4 that when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Well, then after addressing elders, Peter then goes on to speak about those who sit under uh, the leadership. Uh, in verse 5, he says, in the same way, you who are younger... Submit yourselves to your elders. Now, the word that's used there literally just means younger people. Uh, but I think what Peter probably has in mind here is those who are younger in the faith. Uh, they are to recognise the role to which their leaders have been called and to submit to their oversight. And we should notice here, this is not like any kind of blind or unquestioning submission um, I mean, sadly, there's too many stories where in the church leaders have uh, abused their positions. But we see here that Peter's just given this instructions about the character of leadership that should be evident in the church. And it's that kind of humble, servant-hearted leadership. Well, that's the kind of leadership that those who are younger should happily receive. And then to underscore that even further, well, Peter rounds out this section with an instruction to everyone in the church about humility. So in verse 5, he says that all of you uh, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. 
So in all of our relationships within the church, what is to define them is humility. <clears throat> now, humility, I think, can be a tricky thing to define. It's one of those virtues, isn't it, that if you claim to have it, then you probably don't. Uh, and if you claim to not have it, well, that's probably just false humility. It's a bit slippery, isn't it? Uh, how might we define humility? Uh, a few years ago, John Dixon wrote a book about humility called uh, Humilitas. Here's how he uh, defines humility there. He says, humility is the noble choice to forego your status, in, uh, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. More simply, you could say the humble person is marked by a willingness to hold power in the service of others. And he kind of fleshes that out. He says there's three kind of key ideas in that definition. First, that humility pre presupposes your dignity. Uh, he's saying there that humility, is, it's not about having low self-esteem or, or being a doormat or something like that, but it's about using the position you have uh, not grasping hold of that position, but using your status or your power in order to serve others. Uh, second, uh, that humility is willing. That it's a choice that you make. It's not something that's forced on you. And third, that humility is social. Uh, it's not a private act. Uh, it's very hard to just be humble on your own. It's really about how you uh, relate to others. And I think we can see all of those aspects in what Peter is saying uh, here in our passage today. Uh, it's interesting that in his book, um, John Dixon uh, speaks about how in the ancient world before Christianity came, uh, humility was not a virtue at all. It was, a, it was seen as a, a vice, something to avoid. Uh, but of course, the example of Jesus changes all of that as he comes and models for us uh, just how good this kind of uh, leadership and way of relating is. Jesus sets the example for our relationships with one another as he as Paul says, who was in very nature God, did not grasp hold of uh, that position, but he takes on the nature of a servant, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so Paul says in Philippians that we're to have that same mindset as Christ Jesus and clothe ourselves with humility. So that's the first thing Peter's saying here, that humility is to define our relationships within the church. <clears throat> but as he continues, he also tells us that humility is to define our relationship with the world or the society around us. Um, so what kind of status should we as Christians or the Christian church uh, expect to have in the world? Uh, well, I would say, as Peter says here, a humble status. Now, if you look at uh, verse 6, uh, the translation there in the NIV uh, says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Now, I don't do this very often, but I think uh, there's a better way to translate that. And I'll put it on the screen. I've called it John's translation, but it's actually from a good commentary I've been reading. Um, <clears throat> I think a better translation is more accept your humble status, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Uh, what's the difference between those two? <clears throat> well, the difference is that the verb that's used is not an active verb saying for you to actively humble yourself, but it's a passive verb, to uh, more like to accept the humble status or position that you occupy. And, and I think that's what we've been seeing throughout 1 Peter. Uh, that we as Christians in the world, we, we don't occupy and we shouldn't expect to occupy the top seats at the table uh, the we as christians will often be rejected and opposed by the world and the culture around us and peter's saying that we are to accept that that is our position uh, because as peter has said throughout this letter well we are exiles here we are strangers and foreigners we're, we're passing through uh, this is not our home uh, we belong to a kingdom that is not of this world. Uh, we follow a king who humbled himself so that he would be exalted at the proper time. And so the real question here is, well, how will we respond? How will we live as we accept our humble status in the world? And Peter's instruction here, I think, is two things, or maybe two sides of the one coin. He says that we are to trust God and to resist the devil. 
uh, to trust God and to resist the devil. Uh, knowing a humble position in society and aware of the fears that that may bring, well, Peter firstly says in verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Uh, just as Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, and as Peter encouraged us at the end of chapter 4 last week to entrust our lives to our faithful creator, well, so now we are to cast our, our cares, our, our worries on the one who cares for us. Because the reality is that there might be all kinds of anxieties that come our way because of our humble status as Christians. Perhaps that will mean for us loss of status or loss of friends. Um, Peter's spoken through this letter about facing hostility and insults. Uh, he says none of that should surprise us but when those things come, we should remember that we can take those things to God, knowing that he knows. He knows that what you're going through and that he cares. And so we express our trust in him by casting our anxiety on him. And as well as entrusting ourselves to God, well, the flip side of that coin is to resist the devil. So from verse 8, this is the uh, first mention of the devil in the letter. Peter says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So Peter here now reveals who is ultimately behind the opposition or the hostility that we face as followers of Jesus. Uh, behind them is the devil. And he describes this enemy here as like a roaring lion prowling around looking for prey. Now, in the verses just before this, we've seen that he's pictured the, the church as like sheep and shepherds. And so now this image of a roaring lion means that the sheep and the shepherds need to be alert and watchful, uh, aware of the devil's schemes. Uh, we should be alert to his agenda, which is to deceive and to stop us from trusting God, uh, tempting us like he did to Adam and Eve in the garden to deny God and to question his goodness. But the way Peter says to resist the devil is verse 9, to stand firm in the faith, uh, to hold fast to the gospel that we have received and to stand firm with this new community that we are built into, uh, to not be surprised at the sufferings or trials that may come, because, well, that is how it is for God's people everywhere. And we hold fast as well by remembering the promise of our future hope. Now, that's how the letter began, lifting our eyes to the promised inheritance that is being kept in heaven for you. And now Peter here in verse 10 reminds us again of that hope at the end of the letter. He says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast so friends we are to accept our humble status in the world and when we face opposition for our faith we recognize that that is to be expected it's not unusual so we're to be alert resisting the devil and entrusting ourselves to god and his care and what will the result of that be well, as we come to the end of this letter, the result will be that we humbly stand in God's grace. And really, that has been what this whole letter of 1 Peter has been about. Uh, what has been the purpose of this letter? Well, Peter summarizes it for us there in verse 12. He says, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Uh, what Peter has been describing about the Christian life through this letter, this is the true grace of God. What he's been describing is a, a life where we have been chosen as God's elect exiles in the world. That is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. He's been describing a life where in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. 
It's a life where we're called to live as God's holy, set-apart people. That is the true grace of God. A life where we are now being built together into a spiritual house with Christ himself as the cornerstone. A life where we now live as foreigners and exiles here, but are to live such good lives among the pagans that they may see our good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. A life where we've seen today we are called to follow the example of Christ in the world. A life of repaying evil with blessing. A life of suffering before glory. A life of humble and sacrificial service for the sake of others. Peter says that is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. And friends, we can stand fast in it because notice how Peter ends this letter. He ends this letter by reminding us of our location. I said at the beginning that location is uh, what matters in real estate. Well, also knowing our location is so important for us as Christians. And in verse 13, Peter speaks about being located in Babylon, which if, if you can remember right back to the very start of this series, we thought about how that is a symbolic way of saying that we live in this world that is not our true home, uh, where we are foreigners and exiles here. Uh, but even as we live in Babylon, well, Peter says there is a place, there is a location where we truly belong, which he mentions here in these final words. He says, peace to all of you who are in Christ. See, this is our true home, in him, in Christ. We may live for a time now in Babylon, but that is not the location that determines our lives. Babylon is not what gives us our, our status or our identity or our security or our hope. The true place where we belong, our true home, and what determines our lives is this reality that we are in Christ. We are in him as a gift of God's mercy. We've been raised to live a new life with him. And so we live our lives now in him and for him. Friends, this is the true grace of God. May we stand fast in it. Let me pray that God might help us in that. Our Father God, today we do uh, want to thank you for um, this letter of one Peter. We thank you for all that you've been teaching us through it. Now we thank you for how it speaks to us about your great mercy and kindness to us through the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray today that you would help us to live our lives, uh, both as individuals and as a church, in a way that is honouring to you, reflecting Christ and his humility and his grace in our relationships with one another and in the world around us. And we ask those things in Jesus' name. Amen.